Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. I have here a very special guest from one of my most favorite, actually my most favorite TV show, The Sopranos. Please welcome actor Dan Grimaldi here to the show. Dan, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. Thank you very much, Wade. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good, man. On a Sunday, I can't complain. Enjoy me some basketball yesterday with the the tournaments and everything they got going on about to kick off with some March madness. So just been taking it easy, my friend. How about yourself? Uh, you got any favorite? Uh, well, I'm a Duke guy, but they let me down yesterday with, uh, I think it was Virginia tech. I was kind of hoping Ooh. they would give coach K one more, uh, ACC championship, but they kind of let me down, but I don't know, man, I don't see a standout favorite to win this whole thing this year. Nobody really rolling. I mean, I, I got a feeling Gonzaga will be there pretty late, like normal. Right. Um, you know, maybe, maybe Auburn. I don't know. Every time I think somebody might have it, then they lose to somebody that they shouldn't lose to. So it's, it's, well, it's amazing how Gonzaga came out of nowhere years ago, 10 yeah. years ago, whatever it was. And they still, they still got a great teams. Yeah. So they're, they're there every single year. And it's just like, I don't, I mean, I, I don't even know if I know where Gonzaga's at. Was it in, in Washington or somewhere like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I love March Madness. I really do. I think that, well, I love all playoff games because I think that's when everybody comes with their with their number one game, their A game. Right, and, and I agree. Sports, in pro sports and and in in, uh, in college sports, it's it's when you're down to the wire. That's when people come with their A game, and it's fun to watch. These college games, they're always like down down to the last minute. You know, yeah. Was well, like the like the football. I mean, like football this year was incredible. You know, it, it oh, was the. Uh, <laughs> with the playoffs. I mean, it was, Dude, it's insane. Everything went down to a field goal at the, the last playoffs second. this year in NFL might've been probably the best set of playoffs I've ever watched since I've I been agree. watching football. I agree. I think, and I've been watching a lot longer than you have. So. <laughs> you only had two games that were blowouts. I think it was right. the, the Rams and the Cardinals and then the, the Tampa Bay beat Philly a little bit pretty easily. But other right. than that, like you said, everything else was down to the wire, even on down to the Super Bowl. I know it was unbelievable. It was great. It was a great. It was a great uh, game to watch. And you know, ball. March Madness is is incredible. I just love watching. It's it's so, so much fun. Who would you pulling for in the Super Bowl? Uh, well, uh, I I I wanted the Rams to win, but it'd be, yeah, I I guess I was pulling for the Rams. I kind of wanted the Bengals to win, but at the same time, I wasn't unhappy that Stafford got him a win because he suffered for a long time in Detroit right, right, and they right. didn't give him any help. And I knew that was kind of going to be his last hoorah probably, you yeah. know? So the fact that he got one, I'm, I'm yeah. happy with that. I think Joe will probably be back with the Bengals. I mean, they got a good team and they got a good thing going there. A lot of young guys too. Right. Right. So that's going to be a, a, a couple of years. They're going to be going to be fighting for the Super Bowl. So. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I was glad the Rams. Well, uh, we'll get down to it, man. Uh, like I said, you were in one of probably my favorite show of all time, a lot of people's favorite show of all time. But my that favorite ain't where you, <laughs> that's not where you started at. Now, you started, you know, years before that, and you kind of went through some different mo some movies, some TV shows, and we'll, we'll browse over that a little bit because there's one film in particular I want to ask you about. But let's start with the beginning. Like, where did you grow up as a kid? I grew up in Brooklyn, Dyker Heights, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I actually moved back there. Uh, I'm, I'm this is where I am right now. I moved back. I live okay. one block from where I was born. Wow! So I moved back about two a year and a half ago, back to my roots. Now, at an early age, did like you have an acting bug, or you know, was you in like the plays and stuff in school, or not? Not really. Uh, well, in grammar school, I was in plays. You know, I played the B in. Uh, and uh, uh, the B in uh, what was the name of that play? It was a Ferdinand and the Ferdinand and the B. It was a bull and a B. Yeah, I yeah, played, yeah. I played Clement Clock Moore. That was one of those. Uh, uh, it was a uh, that was an interesting play. I wanted to be Scrooge in uh, in uh, Christmas Carol, but they cast me as Tiny Tim, and I was a ham back in the eighth grade. I was only twelve. I was I skipped the grade and uh, and I started school when I was four, so I was two years ahead so I was very young and very small I was like four foot eleven but I wanted to play Scrooge I always wanted to be the lead and uh so when I came out for the uh, I played Tiny Tim so when I came out for the uh curtain call I came out on the crutch so I got a standing ovation but no I never I never were in plays in high school or college or 
nothing. I never had any any inclination that I would become an actor. No, and nobody in my family, nothing. It's, so when, it's very strange that I became an actor. Yeah. It's so when did that strange. kind of start being something that you started pursuing? Because a lot of guys, a lot of actors that I've talked to, you know, they started, they kind of got the bug at a younger age doing plays and, and stuff like that. Well, but then, like you said, some people catch it later. How did that start for you? I was, uh, I, I graduated uh, from Fordham with a, uh, uh, BA in, in math and from NYU with an MS in operations research and CUNY uh, City University with a PhD in uh, data processing. So I went to work for Bell Labs, uh, I, which is the top think tank in the country. I was kind of a, you know, a, a, a big candidate for that. And I got a job and I was very excited. I got married at the same time. Uh, so us Italian boys, we went from a uh, and but in those days, you went from your mother's house to your to your wife's to, yeah. to live with your wife. There was no living on your own, so um, everything was new: new car, new apartment, new job. And when I went to work at Bell Labs, I was not that happy. I think what was what it was was I was an academician most of my life, so uh, I I didn't understand. You know, nine to five was an was an un, unknown entity to me. Right. Uh, Creating your own work was an unknown entity. And I just, you know, and I didn't like being at work when it got dark. So, so I, uh, I would come home every day and complain uh, that I, you know, I, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I made the right choice. I don't know what I can be, but blah, 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 blah. So I came home every day complaining, complaining, complaining. And then one day, uh, this is, that was started in July. And like one day in November, this is all this months of complaining, uh, but going to work and doing my job, you know, I was, I was a good, a good employee, but uh, I woke up one day and said, I could be an actor. That's what I can be. And I have no idea why. I don't know where the idea came from. It was not in my existence. I had no, I had no reference to it. I just woke up and then, and then I, I, uh, my, uh, my, my wife at the time said to me, uh, why don't you go study with Lee Strasberg? I didn't know who he was. She knew more about him than I did. And I, I, Italian, I said, after the holidays. So the holidays came and went and I called the Strasberg Institute and I went down there for an interview and I spoke to the uh, receptionist and she was very, very uh, hot on getting me to go to a class right then. And I promised her that I would go to class. I promised I would join and I would go to class. Uh, years later, she said that she she just wanted me to go. She didn't want me to walk away for whatever reasons. She had this instinct, whatever it was. Yeah. Got so good. in those days, uh, Strasburg had a, had a uh, uh, Strasburg gave a lecture at Carnegie Hall on Monday, and then you had two method exercises classes on Tuesday and Thursday for for two hours each. So, being a very naive person, I w lived in Brooklyn, worked in Jersey and figured that I would get to Manhattan, leaving Jersey at five o'clock, get to Manhattan, park my car, and get to, uh, get to, um, to, to the lecture by six o'clock, which was in Carnegie Hall. Needless to say, I got, I got the uh, parking space. I did on 50, 57th and 6th Avenue, and I walked up the block, it was about 6.15. I got to the door of Carnegie Hall, and I said, what the hell are you doing? You know, you're afraid that you, maybe you're going to fail, that you're not going to succeed, or maybe you're afraid of success in the computer field. Mm -hmm. uh, and what are you going to tell your friends? You go to acting school. This is this is like something you could brag about. So I turned around. I started walking away. I got to the uh, Little Carnegie Theater, which is no longer there, next to the Russian Tea Room. And I stopped and I said to myself, you know, you've been a mathematician. You've been a computer scientist. Uh, all because when Sputnik went up, there was a lot of money in math and science, and you've never really made a decision as to what you wanted to do with your life. So this might be your destiny, and you could be throwing it right out the window if you keep walking. And I said to myself, you're right. I turned around. I walked back. I listened to Strasberg's lecture. The next day, I went to an exercise class. I walked in. I sat down. And they were doing method exercises. There were six people on a stage, apparently unaware of each other. I didn't know what was going on. Um, one one uh, actor was doing a pain exercise. I thought they should have called a, called a doctor because I really believed it. <laughs> and, and I sat back and I said, I'm home. 
this is where I belong. And from that first class on, I've had a passion for acting that has, has never, never, never died. And it, it still exists today. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your first film. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in the little research that I did, you were doing a play and you were spotted by the producers of that film and they wanted you to play, what was it, Don't Go in the House, right? The lead in Don't Go in the House? Correct, correct. Uh, it wasn't that I was spotted by the producers. The producer, director, writer, and I went to acting school together. Okay, so you already knew him. I knew him, yes. Okay. But he came to the play three times to validate my talent. And uh, we, and then, and then I, I was given the part. But it was, it, it, he really uh, put me through um, a validation. Uh, a validation, uh, it wasn't just, you're my friend, you're gonna have the part. Right. So now I've, I've seen a little bit of don't go in the house. And so if that's what he wanted you to play, what I don't know is what the hell kind of play you were doing for him to picture you in that role. <laughs> Cause that's a little doing, bit different. You know, I was doing a play called mama's little angels written by Louis LaRusso the third. And, um, I just played the older brother of an Italian family who wanted revenge against his father who killed his mother. So, uh, no, it was just that it was a, it was a kitchen, kitchen play. And it was a very, very good play. LaRusso was a great writer, rest in peace. And I did a lot of his work, but, uh, it was my first off Broadway lead. And, uh, I, I did it with Janet Sarno, Matt Landers, rest in peace, uh, uh Ray Sarah, rest in peace. And that was in 1978. Uh, and I did that for six months. So, uh, the part of Donnie Cola, um, no, that was not based on the part of, of, of Mama's, in Mama's Little Angels. Now, what did you read the script? Did they give you the script? They just said they wanted you on this part. How did that work? I mean, at some point you had to read that script and got to think, whoa, now this is a little something different. Now, when you're a young actor and you're, you're and even an old actor, when a part comes along where you're a lead or you're, uh, you're to be showcased in any way, got to jump on uh, you, you grab it. Yeah. Now, and what a lot of people don't know if you've not seen this movie, cause it is a little older, but this was kind of like a slasher film before slasher films got real big. This was like, this was pre Friday the 13th, if I'm not mistaken. Right. You're not mistaken. It was the top grocer in the country to outgross the shining. Yeah. It was, it was uh, I, 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 it was a horror film, but I kept selling yeah. it as a psychological thriller. Of course, he was a victim of abuse. So right. I didn't I didn't want to be my first film to be a horror film, but it was. It was a horror film. But I kept saying it's a psychological thriller because <laughs> it's based, based on an abused child. So and you it. were basically I'll let you tell kind of give us a brief story of what your character done in that movie. And from what I understand, I think you even kept the suit that you wore when you were using the flamethrower. <laughs> Is that, that accurate? <laughs> Where did you hear that? <laughs> I can't reveal all my sources, man, but they said you kept the suit that you used when you're. I did. I, did. <laughs> I had it in my garage for years. Then I realized asbestos was bad for you. It was an asbestos <laughs> suit. <laughs> well, it, Donnie Cola was an abuse, was abused as a child. His mother would burn him when he was bad. And she was a religious nut and said, you know, she was burning the evil out of him. And as with most uh, abuse cases, uh, you know, you were abused as a child and then you carry it on. So he, he became uh, psychologically an abuser and he picked up women. It was, it was a great ad for, for young girls not to get in cars, no matter how the guy looked. Yeah. Or, or how nice he was not to get in the car. Back then there were no cell phones, don't forget. This yeah. is 1980. So he would pick up women and lure them into his house and then he would burn them to death with a flamethrower. <laughs> he would dress in an asbestos suit. He would pour, uh, he built a room. He built a steel room and he would tie them naked uh, and then he would burn them to death with a uh, flamethrower. And he had an asbestos suit. And I did keep, <laughs> I did, <laughs> I did keep the suit. And I really, I had it for years and years and years. And I really, I, I always wished I would have kept it because it could have been a great Halloween costume. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. Well, if anybody out there, I know we have a lot of horror movie fans because we've interviewed a few stars from horror movies on our show. If you've never seen that, it's worth a look because like I said, it was 
I want to say cutting. I can use the phrase cutting edge at the time because it was more that shock value before you got your Freddies and Jasons and, and stuff like that. So it was kind of started that trend. It laid the groundwork for a lot of what your slashers will become later on. Like you know, said, I was you know, shining. The special effects of the of the girl being the first girl being burned. It only goes out of out of out of uh, focus uh, just for a split second. Yeah. And for the 1980, it was a spectacular effect, really, when you think about it. Yeah. You know, for, for uh, she she really does look like she's burning to death, yeah. which is horrific. But you know, in terms of in terms of creative special effects, it was really great. Yeah. Um. Now your next one, Junk Man. Ah, <laughs> you're really now, going back in time. Now I'm a big HB Halaki fan. I always you have are. I you am. Are. A lot um, of people he was, he was, when they hear he was, gone in 60 seconds, they're like, oh, you know, Nicolas Cage. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This goes back way before that. You know, he was a, he was a sweetheart. And he believed, you know, he had he had a junkyard and he had a yeah. he had a hundred classic cars. Uh he uh well, and I think he was, I think basically he was a car thief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a sweetheart and he believed he could make films better than the studios. Yeah. And unfortunately he was killed. You know, he died yeah. on the set, but I had a great relationship with him. I, I made the uh, junk man. And then, uh, and oh, then I forget the name. Two, I think it was. Yeah. 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 The two movies. And uh, you know, that was when I was out in California trying to look for work and he was a sweetheart. He really was. I, I really, I really, uh, Lot, like Toby a lot. He was. He. I liked working for him, and everybody in his. Everybody that worked for him was in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was looking through the IMDb's of them, a lot of the same names was popping up. But see, I was able to find all those on when I seen the original Gone to see, or excuse me, when I seen the remake. When I started doing research, I'm the type of guy when I see something, I'll go and research it and kind of research about it. When I seen it was a remake, well, I was like, all right, well, let me go track down this remake. So I got that one, then I got the junk man, then gone in 60 seconds too. So I had all these on DVD years and years ago, way early. And so yeah. I looked into a lot of his stories and like when he would put these movies in the theaters, he had a guy, I don't know, maybe you know him, I don't know, but they called him Big Tiny that he would send around to collect his money. He'd be like, Mr. Halaki wants his money for the movie being in the theater. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm familiar with this story. I think that, I think it was the junk man until like Oh three held or maybe 2013. I can't remember. They held like the record for most car crashes and airplane oh, yeah. crashes in a movie. I was going to say the reason he, I mean, he crashed a car, but he had, a, he had a junkyard. So yeah. they would fix the car and it'd be back, you know, back on the, back on the set the next day. You know, so, so he had, and, and he had a collection of, of, of classic cars. He loved yeah. cars. I mean, he loved cars, but there was a, that was a, don't go in, uh, not don't go in the house, but the junk man was like, there was a 20 minute car chase yeah. with the, and the chickens were flying and it was, <laughs> but, it, and, and Hoyt Axton was a lot of fun. Hoyt Axton was my partner in that. Yeah. And uh, we had a lot of fun and they were all, you know, they all drove Jaguars. I'm, I'm driving around in a, a beat up old Ford and they're driving Jaguars and, and they had, a, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun making those movies. I bet but, you and, did. But like I said, when their car crashed, it was back in the shop. It was out on the, out on the, on the lot, on the lot the next day. It, yeah, they it was, said he crashed cars all the time. And like you said, ultimately did wind up, you know, passing away from a car crash, but probably could have went a lot sooner from things I've read about him because he would crash cars all the time. Yeah, he was, he was a character. He was a character. He was a good, he was a good, he was a good man. He really was. He was a good man. He was a, he was from another generation, you know, for sure. a whole different, whole different uh, lifestyle. Well, rest in peace to him for sure. Like I said, also, I think, I'll, if I'll, I'm not sure you probably know, but his wife was involved with the remake. If I believe, if I remember correctly, I think she sold the rights or yes, I think so. Like that something yeah. to, like because when it came out i was i was the same way i told me may go gone in 60 seconds the 20 25 years ago so yeah. well see back in those times it wasn't quite as easy to get on and, and find out all this information so a lot of stuff right. like even now if i'm watching a movie now and i'm curious about it and i hadn't seen it in a couple of years i'll go and i'll pull up like a research page and i, I like to see like how things were done issues they might have run into on the set 
you know, problematic scenes, stuff like that. Right. And this right. was even before I done this show. I just read it because I like to read it. I'm the kind I'm, right. I look through, I watch a movie with the commentary to hear the director and actors talk. You know, I'm just, I've always been that type right. of guy. Yeah, and that's funny. just to get that information. So that's when I found out about, you know, there being the other one and then went back and got them all. And I wish I had the cases for you. I'd show them to you. But I, when I made room for this little studio here, I boxed up all my cases and I've now got the just the discs and like the big folders. So there's somewhere right. in the attic. I said, well, it'd take me all damn day to try to find those. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. You're bringing it back. Those were good memories. I bet it was, man. I, I remember watching those things. I was like, I bet these guys had a ball filming this. Well, we I mean, that's like... It's like every actor, especially guy actors dream, just go out here and just wreck cars and not, not give a yeah. damn. <laughs> well, sometimes it was scary because we like to drive very fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and we, were, we were, we were, we were in that uh, ravine in, in LA and you, you couldn't put your elbow out of the car because you'd, you'd, you'd hit the wall. He was that close to the wall. <laughs> it was scary. It was scary at times. I was, I wouldn't say it cause I was too macho, but I was scared, scared. I was frightened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you go on you do a lot you you stay pretty busy you're in tv shows you're in movies here and there but your big kind of monumental role comes when the sopranos rolls around that's what exactly. you know you're going to be known for for here on out and forever i mean unless you run up on something else another one but i just don't know if there's going to be another sopranos no they'll beyond. never be they'll never be another show as good as the sopranos i don't think i i, I really don't uh, what I tell people is the writing it was the best writing in television history. You go back to the 50s when when a TV was in New York and Patty Chayetsky and playwrights and every actor, you know, Marlon Brando, Steve McQueen, they were all on TV shows. And that was the golden age of television and it went to L.A. and it just was watered down quite a bit. But the Sopranos actually exceeded that kind of writing. And, and the writing is what really makes the Sopranos so superior uh, i mean it's without a doubt uh the best written show in the history of television and i give all the credit david chase genius and all of the writers just uh, uh robin green mitch uh mitch uh burgess and uh and uh terry winter terry winter yeah so many so many great guys that uh, that work guys and girls that worked as as writers and, and we just had the best writers in the the best writers in history so how did that come along? For yes, you? I will that be, opportunity it, yeah, it, it, I said, like, how did that? Well, opportunity there was come an audition for uh, my first. Okay, my first audition was for uh, Sunshine, the car deal, right? So, uh, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and it was and uh, a pretty, yeah, famous director got it. I forget his name, but I, I was disappointed. I'm glad I didn't get it, but I was disappointed that, of course, I didn't get it, and. Uh, then the part of uh, the part of Philly was being auditioned, and at that point, every actor in America wanted to be on this on the Sopranos because it had it it had one season in and it was a big hit. Mm -hmm. So I auditioned for Philly, and I I got the part, and it was three days work, and I was very happy. I had that long monologue in the car. It yep. looked like I was going to be a big character, and in four minutes, I was dead. Yeah. So, so when we shot it, Alan Coulter, who was became one of my angels, I said to Alan, do you think you could uh, not kill me? And he said, Danny, sometimes, you know, the best thing that happens to people on this show is they get killed. I said, I, I, I don't see how, Alan, but maybe you could miss. So, so but that didn't happen. But what did happen, which was uh, why I am really very, very grateful and probably the luckiest guy on the show, was that uh, they were in Naples filming, filming the Italian uh, scenes mm -hmm. and uh, I was I, we shot this in in Jersey in New York and when they came back uh, they Chase was looking at the rushes and this you know he he said this on podcasts and thing and he looked at the rushes and he looked up at the uh, screen and he said who's this guy I don't want him dead why'd I kill him and he turned to uh, Terry Winter and he said you can use the you can use the uh, the, the twin card once I'm going to use it now. I didn't know that. Alan Coulter, Coulter called me after they were in the rushes and he said to me, Danny, I just want to tell you that, um, you know, David, David loved your work. He loves you. He thinks you were terrific. And I said, thank you very much. And when I got off the phone, I was, I was a little angry. And my oldest son, Michael said to me, 
Dad, what are you angry about that? I said, Mike, I, you know, praise is great and I love it. I'm glad I get it, but I, I want to work. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't, I need, I need work. And, and so I was, uh, so I waited six months. They kept, they kept being, um, they kept being little, little hints that I might go back. And I told my youngest son, I went to Italy that summer. And I told my youngest son, if they call, no matter what time it is, call me. Because I want to know I'm going back. And sure enough, about five o'clock in the morning, I was in Florence and he calls and they said, Dad, you're going back. So I, uh, they created Patsy. And that's, that was, Patsy did 45 episodes and he's, uh, he's my man. You know? Wow. Now, did, so did you have to interview for that part you said, or? Yeah, I auditioned. It was a, a, a single audition and Chase, I auditioned for Chase. And uh, I went in and I, I, you know, I did the, I did the, I did the sides. I did the, the, the copy that we were supposed to audition with. And I, I, you love this when somebody says it. And he said to me, you got a minute. I, I want you to read, uh, I want you to read something else, you know, another scene. And of course, you know, in the back of your head, you say, no, I don't, I'm going to say no. Of course. I, yeah. I, you know, no, you I want my, wife, here's my right arm. You want it. <laughs> so he, so I, I figured at that point, there were about 25 guys auditioning for the part. And I was like in the middle. So I figured, okay, so I guess I, I, I beat out the guys ahead of me, but there's still 12 guys to go. So I didn't know. And later on, they called me and told me I had the part, which was, uh, which was very exciting. I mean, I was very excited and very grateful to be Philly. To be Patsy is beyond gratitude. I am just, I am just so lucky and so, so grateful that, that he created Patsy. And I'm very grateful to Chase for my career on The Sopranos. Yeah. Now, was George Ann Walken in there too? Yes, yes, she, yeah, she was the one that, you know, she, she was the casting director that allowed me to have the, have the audition. She, my agent submitted me and George Ann Walken, uh, uh, and she was very proud because I was like, you know, I, she had found me, quote unquote, and then I became a character that he loved, so. Uh, now, am I correct? Was, Is that Christopher Walken's wife? Yes, you are absolutely correct. Yes, you are. Wow. Well, I guess being married to him, she knows a thing or two about spotting some good actors. She's around one quite a bit. <laughs> oh yeah. She know hey, nobody nobody reads a line better than Chris Walken. Yeah. Nobody nobody can. <laughs> He's definitely got his own style. But, I mean, done a ton yeah, of good does. work, you know, King he of New does. York, Pulp Fiction. Oh, yeah. I mean, all of all this. I can go I on for days. I saw him off I saw him off Broadway in a play called Kid Champion back in, I don't know, you know, the early seventies or whatever before he became famous and he was great then. And, and yeah. you know, you just knew it. You could see it. You could feel it. So now we interviewed John Fiore on the show. And I got to tell you, he said his favorite scene was clipping you right off the bat. He said that was his favorite scene was in the car. And he's like, you know, I'd met dad, talked to him that day. And I think he did say everybody else was in Italy. He, I think he said that too. And y'all done the scene. And he said, well, you know, I had to shoot him. And I said, you know, watching that, and I'm not saying I've ever had an experience doing this, but just, you knew that had to be loud in the car. So whenever <laughs> he did it, the first thing he did is he covers his ears. And I'm like, I don't know if they dubbed that sound in later or exactly how it was, but it was, it was, it was, loud. It. It was loud. And, and they told me to make sure I shut my eyes because you never know if there's little pieces of shrapnel flying around. Right. So I would go, you know, turn your head, but make sure you shut your eyes, then put, close your eyes. So I had to shut them before you could see it. You know, I didn't want, you know, you didn't want it to be seen. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it was loud. It was loud. It was ringing in our ears afterwards. It was very loud. No, John and I, great friends. I mean, from that moment on, we, you know, and, and, and when Patsy was created, John or Gigi was a character that, it continued for a couple of a uh, couple of seasons and every day we every week we would say you think i'm gonna get killed this week it was like we were really in the mob it was like we didn't know if we were gonna get killed or not yeah and the one thing the one thing was which was my joy and uh, which i really always wanted was i wanted to be standing at the end and that yeah. happened uh, patsy was alive at the end one of the few that uh, that made it through the series yeah what well, you tony and paulie i think was about to really the only ones that made it yeah, that's it. And Silvio is in the hospital. Yeah, he's in a, he's in a coma. You don't know if he's yeah. coming out or not. Doesn't look good, right. but you know, it was a, it was one of my one of my dreams, and it came true. And I was very happy for that to be one of the last men standing. 
Yeah, I know. He even mentioned that uh, the joke, whenever you started having that arc where you were a little pissed at Tony and well, actually you went and you pissed in his pool, as a matter of fact, <laughs> <laughs> he said, that was like, I guess I didn't know how you, if you guys got the script or if y'all got them, you know, a little bit of time, but he was like, it's looking like you're going to have to kill me again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the thing. You know, you never knew. You never knew from day yeah. to day when you were going to get killed. It's, you know, like when he got elevated, when uh, John Fury, when Gigi got elevated and he was, he was on a collision course with Ralphie. Yep. And I knew Ralphie had a two year contract. So uh, you knew Gigi was going to go. So yeah. at some point, and that was, that was sad, but um, uh, you know, and peeing in the pool was funny when I read the script, we didn't get the scripts ahead of time. We got them, you know, weekly. We, we would, if you're in, if you were in the episode, you weren't in the episode, I was a fan, just like you, I'd watch it. I didn't know what was going on. But when I got the first episode being in the pool, I was actually delighted because I said, that's what people are going to know me for. I'm the guy who peed in Tony's pool and I can always introduce myself. If they don't, if they don't, if, if they don't recognize me, they'll know who he, who that is. So that yeah, the was, FBI that is up there in the tree and they're looking, he's like, who the hell is that? That's Pat Smith. He's peeing in the pool. Yeah, it's funny. And it's like, it, it, it's like when I hit the guy over the head with the, uh, with the pipe, uh, my father, my father was a longshoreman and his, and his, uh, his nickname was lead pipe Louie. And ah. he used to carry a lead pipe. And when, and when I saw that, I, 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 w I freaked out. I told Chase, you have no idea what this means to me. You know, <laughs> you know, having a lead pipe, like my father carried when he was, when he was young, that's it. That's crazy. Who are you Ralph Bunch over here? And that's when you right. <laughs> and you know, and you know, it's funny because I, I told Chase when we read that script after the table read, I said to him, you know, the only people that know who Ralph Bunch is, is me, you, and the writer. And he, said, <laughs> I, he said, I know, that's okay. Because they wrote, those writers wrote for themselves. They didn't cater to what the mentality of what might be. Right. They wrote so that, and the, the great thing about The Sopranos is that no matter what your 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 intelligence level, you get something out of it. No matter who you are, whether you're a you're you know you're a Mensa or or you're uh, you know someone who's not not that that uh, that high in in your in your intelligence quotient, you still got something out of the Sopranos. I always said when I peed in the pool, if if you were a certain type of person, you said ah the guy was drunk, you had to go to the bathroom. If he was somebody else, you would say, no, he was impotent. He couldn't shoot the guy. So this is the best he could do to violate him. So yeah. it was on so many levels, The Sopranos is written. And that's why it's such a great show, too, adding to, you know, the great dialogue and the characters and everything else and the plots. Yeah. The dialogue in there is something else. And I laugh. I, I rewatch this show all the time. And when I, I tell, I've told a few guys a story, I was already a fan. And when I met my wife, one of the first times she come over to my house ever I'm watching the show or the episode where they killed Ralph. Uh, they've already killed Tony's already killed him and they got him upstairs in the tub and he goes to grab his head and the toupee comes off. And this is like <laughs> almost right time she gets in there. And I'm like, Oh, it's my favorite show the Sopranos. So she sits on the couch or watching it, and she's kind of looking at it, And then he chops his head off and then puts it in a bowling bag and <laughs> She's just, you know, looking at me and then they chopped the hands off. And she's like, do you want to go somewhere like and turn this off? Or I don't know what you got going on here. But the crazy part, you fast forward now, we've been together almost 20 years and she's actually a school counselor. So the counseling part, she loves between Tony and Melfi. So she watches oh, it with me now. When I, when I rewatch it, she rewatches it. But just the dialogue in there, because one of them I seen, it was a matter of fact, I seen it today where Tony's admitting to Carmela that he's going to therapy and she's like, Oh, I'm so happy you're going. I'm so happy it is. And he's like, well, geez, you think I was Hannibal lecture before Hannibal lectures. <laughs> the they do those things that those little nuances and uh, right. what was his name? He was the worst at it. Um, Carmine Jr. Yes. Carmine Jr. Good Lord. Yeah. He, Ray Ray Bruce. Bruce. yeah. Ray Bruce. yeah. He, that dude made me laugh every time he was on there. <laughs> <laughs> He did everything so seriously. You know, Ray's a great actor. Yeah. And he did everything. He, he carried those lines so seriously. They have to make you laugh. 
<laughs> and, and you know, Paul, you know, the Sopranos is a comedy at its heart. It's, it is. It really is. It's, it's a comedy it's mixed in with really, some gangster. You're right. It's really a comedy, and it's about every man. It's you know, the guy has the guy has problems at work and problems at home. Yeah. And that's that's why it's so relatable because Tony Soprano is really every man. The only thing is he solves his problem by killing people, and we can't Correct. do that. Correct. That we can't relate to. Now, Pauly is another character in there. You never, the only guy you really had run-ins with, I guess, or problems with Chrissy for a short <laughs> period of time. You pretty much got yeah. along with everybody there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Patsy was a pretty, pretty affable guy. He was quiet, you know. And I, uh, you know, I, I created him completely different from Philly. Philly was a loud mouth, so Patsy was a quiet man. And right, you know, you know yourself, the guy, to, the guy to be afraid of is the guy. That's quiet guy yeah so, the guy know, that don't talk his mouth off is uh is got shoots his mouth off. the quiet guy in the corner you don't know what's going on in his mind so that's yeah. that's what i was hoping for yeah i think the, Paulie, Paul, i was paulie's uh you know right hand man and, yeah uh, so, and i i knew uh i knew tony sirico since we were young you know we grew up in he grew up in brooklyn not far from we were not far away from each other we we kind of knew each other uh through the years we were and that, that goes for a lot of people on The Sopranos. A lot of us were, we worked together or we knew each other uh, because a lot of people have been around uh, the acting business for quite a while. Okay. Yeah, Tony sirico has got a heck of a story. I mean, he was, you know, real deal mob guy for a, a little while there until he went to, well, he done a couple of stints in the can, but I think he said one time in there, they'd done like a play in there and then that kind of yeah. got him in the bug of acting. Yeah, that's how he got interested in, in, in acting and then he pursued it when he got out. Yeah. Uh, I'll see things like, like I'll go back and I watch the movie. There was a movie called Dead Presidents. Uh, it was a really good movie. Had Lorenz Tate in it. Uh, basically where they robbed an armored truck and at the end of it, Chris Tucker's in it and I guess they're starting to find the guys and they run in and Chris Tucker's like laying there with the heroin needle in his arm. He's overdosed at this time. And like that lead cop is Paulie. The ah, cop that goes yeah. in. I don't even know if he has a speaking part. He just goes yeah. in and then he's like the first well, guy. You know, see. We, we all start out doing extra work and, and learning about the camera. And it, it, I, I taught acting. Uh, I taught acting at the Lee Strasberg Institute. I taught in uh, my own classes. And uh, it, I always, one of the things I, I, I would tell my students is, you know, go, go to work as an extra, go to work at, you know, do, do student films because you'll learn more about yeah. uh, the, the film acting by doing it than you will in a classroom. So go out yeah. and do that. So, so we all, we all start somewhere. Yeah. Soak we up all, as much knowledge and information as you can. If this is a passion yeah. of yours, even if you don't got a speaking part for your background an right. extra, it doesn't matter what it is. Go so no. see how other people watch other people doing it. Exactly. And that's what I would tell my students. I did it myself. That's what I did. Yeah. You know, I did extra work for about a year and, and, and after a year I said, well, that's enough. I'm not going to do it anymore. But I learned a lot about film. I mean, I didn't know, I didn't take courses in film acting. And so that helped me a great deal. Like at, just as you said, watching, watching good actors work and, and mm -hmm. learning from that. So you got paid, you got paid to go to school. So. Yeah. And those things are a little, I guess the pay scale is a little different and I'm not a, really a hundred percent on that. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like an extra is on one certain set of pay scale, but once you open your mouth and you have any sort of a speaking part that bumps you to another scale. Is that correct? Exactly. Oh yeah. Yeah. Bumps your way up. Bro. Okay. Yeah. It makes you a day player. It's a, you know, an extra, an extra is just background. So you get paid. I mean, it's not, not, it's not like you get nothing, but it's, it's not what you get when you're uh, when you're a day player, when you right. have a speaking role. Right. Okay. And so then now, it's weekly, it's daily, weekly, and then it's, uh, you know, regular and recurring. There's all kinds of levels that you reach and salary is compensatory with that. Yeah. I'm, uh, I live here in Charleston, South Carolina, and they oh, have a, a lot of stuff place. down here. Yeah, what it a is. a beautiful place. <laughs> I love it Charleston. It's beautiful. It is. It's nice. And they, they're starting to film a lot of stuff down here. Um, Danny McBride. I don't know if you know who Danny McBride is. He does. I know the uh, name. Yeah. He done the HB show, uh, Eastbound and Down, like the right. baseball player. I yeah. mean, he's been in a ton of movies, Pineapple Express, all kind of stuff. Very, very funny guy. But he started doing stuff more behind the camera. And they filmed the recent, uh, not the most recent one, but the one before that, the reboot of Halloween. I know it was Halloween, like, 
57 or whatever number they're on. <laughs> but the one where they brought back Jamie Lee Curtis and they right, had right, that right. was shot right. down here in Charleston. And then right. they used a lot of local guys. I actually have one of the local guys on the show. He lives here. He was in the first movie and in the second one that they had out last year. Um, he also filmed, I don't know if you've heard of the show, Righteous Gemstones, about that TV angelic family that I, I haven't ever actually sat and watched the show, but it looks pretty crazy. But it's basically like those TV evangelists you see on TV right. from back right. in the day. It's, it's something like that. And a lot of people say it's very good. I, I don't have a lot of free time here lately to watch a lot of stuff, but they say it's very funny. And he films that down here in Charleston. So a lot of stuff gets filmed down here. Yeah, a lot of stuff is getting filmed in a lot of different places out of, outside of New York and L.A because of the tax breaks and uh, right. the weather and, uh, you know, whatever. But that, that it's good to see that, you know, regionally that things are being done because, you know, actors need work everywhere. Yeah. You know, and, right. so the, and so the crew people and, and a lot of them are located in those areas. So that, that's good. That's a good yeah. thing. There's a, a lot of in Atlanta, a lot's yeah. in Atlanta. And uh, so, so that's good. South Carolina is a great place. Yeah. I love it. It was a Netflix show, The Outer Banks. I think a lot of that is shot around here locally. So, right. yeah, a lot of good opportunities for people. Like I said, even if you just put in to go be an extra, just to kind of see the experience and see what it's right, like. Right, right. You know, get that. Now, one of the other more famous scenes that you had that I liked was when you had to take a car ride with <laughs> Gloria Trillo. Oh, yeah. Oh, now, yeah. Her, her real name escapes me right now. What was what's her name? Annabella, Annabella Shiora. Shiora, that's right. Annabella Shiora. So that was in season three, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And because that was when he had that whole deal going. I remember that because of the Pine Barrens episode. He was with Gloria during the Pine Barrens. And I know Pine Barrens was in season three. You have to take her off into a car lot, basically deliver this message that she needs to leave Tony the hell alone. Right. Who delivered that? So cold, so callous, so scary. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm just like, damn, I'd have been scared to be in that car. But now I don't want to underplay her role either because she oh, geez, in the beginning was just like, if I'm not back in 20 minutes, they're going to call the cops. And you're just looking like, I mean, it was fantastic. How did you guys, did y'all rehearse that any, you know, very much? I mean, you played it both. You know, great. You, don't you know, you don't rehearse that much. You rehearse a little bit. And, um, Annabella is a fantastic actress. She's been one most of her life and she's a great, you know, I, I, we're friends and, and, and she's a terrific actress. Um, the, uh, we, we, I shot, I, I shot my close up with, uh, with an assist, with an assistant director. She wasn't there when I shot my close up. Okay. I, I was there with her close up, but when, and um, my direction from Chase, all he said to me was, you're giving her a gift for life. And that's, yeah. that was the direction. And, and that's what I, I ran with it, you know? So it was, uh, it's been said that it's probably the scariest scene in the whole series. It's, it's definitely of one he, of them. Because... The way he handled himself. And then he goes and then his my, wife is yelling at him as what he's supposed to buy from the grocery store, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well it's just cool because the way you ended it too it's like you know and my face will be the last one you see not tony's and it won't be cinematic you didn't right. go into glory detail it wasn't like a i'll kill you just plain threat but that it won't be cinematic just let her know everything she needed to know right was, well that's the writing you know yeah. that's the writing they, they 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 wrote those lines and we just delivered them you know and, yeah i mean we, we give some, we, we elevate them, but, but they, they, they're pearls of wisdom. They really are. Cause there wasn't great. too much ad libbing on that show, right? That y'all don't, you weren't allowed to vary. Zero, yeah. zero, zero. Uh, we had to say words as written and, you know, I worked for Louis LaRusso who I mentioned. And like I said, he passed away, but, uh, my first play mama's little angels. Uh, he, he, when I, after I did the play, He's, he, we had a lot of conversation. One of the things he said, do you know, I sweat over every word. He said, I really do. Writers really do devote a lot of time to every word. And the only time I will say, when I have the fight with Christopher and uh, I, I spit, uh, the script said, he, uh, uh, Patsy spits. He has the bat, he spits. 
And I, I said to the director, I said, you know, when we spit, we usually curse. We usually say, to you bastard. Or, my father used to say, to you dirty bastard, which I forgot at the moment. <laughs> so I said, you know, can I say something? And they made like six phone calls up to David Chase and Chase said it was okay. And so it, it took a lot to change. The only person who could have any ad-libbing was Tony, was, was Jimmy. Jimmy was the only one that had, and even then he didn't do it very much. Word written, word spoken. That's that was the rule on the Sopranos. Now let's let's touch on Jimmy for a minute and rest in peace to him. But yeah, damn, what a fantastic actor. Yep, and a and a fantastic man too. Just yeah, just a, a, a terrific, terrific talent that we lost, but a really generous man to a fault. And you know, he didn't like fame. Uh, the money was good, but he didn't yeah. like the fame. And uh, he was just generous with everybody. He's sweet. You would see him six o'clock in the morning, maybe hung over, and he would never turn down an autograph. He would never turn down a picture. He was always generous to the fans. Uh, like those of us from the, the older generation, the fans are our paycheck. We love the fans. Um, and uh, he was just wonderful with, with people. And on the set, uh, I mean, he would... There was sushi night every Friday night. He would buy the crew sushi every Friday night. He was just a very generous, very loving, loving person. Yeah, I mean, just the fantastic guy. And movies he had done before that, you know, the with the Mexican. And I'll tell you a movie that I really liked that he'd done uh, that don't get mentioned a whole lot was 8 Millimeter. I thought oh, he was yeah. great in 8 Millimeter. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and then what he was in true romance wasn't he in true romance as yeah, well? true, yeah that that's what that's part of what got him the part in the right. soprano yeah true romance and then he was the a violence that he showed in, in true yeah. romance yeah. was it be cool or i don't know where he played bear or whatever right i think it was be cool I, the name of that one, yeah. I mean just no. such he was on his way yeah. he was a third lead. he was a third lead and he was he was working and you know, he was riding his bicycle around the village and bartending. And and then once the Sopranos hit, that was the end of all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. Which is which is a good thing, but it's also a burden that you have to bear when you're that famous. Yeah, it comes with a, especially, you know, a character like he portrayed in there. There's a lot of interviews where he says, you know, look, I'm nothing like my character. I'm very boring. I'm very plain, you know. Nothing. Well, he but, wasn't boring, but he, but he was nothing like Tony Soprano. Except the temper. You did have that kind of temper. <laughs> I watched some behind the scenes stuff where I think it was, I don't know if it was Christopher, he was doing it too, but they were in the hospital. And I think it was like when he grabbed him and slammed him up against the wall and he kept trying to do it over and over. And he's just like, stop. He's like, this fucking turning thing doesn't work. And he's like walking <laughs> off the scene. I'm just like, he's really into that boy. I mean, oh, yeah. just... oh, no. he was a, he was a, he was a, a very, very crafted actor. I mean, he was, he believed in his craft. He worked at it. Uh, you know, the first two seasons, he never had a day off. And on the weekends, he had to learn little lines. It was, it was not an easy job. Uh, and he delivered it magnificently. Uh, yes. And, you know, so, so we, we, we miss him. And uh, he was, uh, he would have given us much more much more joy through his acting and through his life, you know, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we miss him. He was the, a great guy. The new movie that came out, the many saints in Newark, they had his son play him. And mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second of what you thought about the movie and how you thought it went, but there was a specific scene when he's sitting in there at that table. And I think it's his mom giving him shit about something. And he's sitting, he kind of sits back in that table and, and he does that. And I seen Jimmy, like that was just what he done. When he got pissed, he would do that nose wiping thing and just kind of do that. And I was just like, wow, like he nailed that mannerism to a T and I thought he'd done great in the movie. What did you think of many saints in Newark? I, I, well, I thought, I thought Michael did a great job and I, I, he did study his father's mannerism. I mean, I'm sure he had some of, some of them just naturally because yeah. he was done, but I, he did study his father and he did deliver to Rick terrifically. You know, I, I, I thought the many saints of Newark, you know, they capsulized the, 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 the young, you know, those, the young group as they were growing up and, and his father and his uncle 
and Uncle Junior, of course, who was a, a beloved character. Oh yeah. So I think I think that many saints did a good job in in re in creating or giving us that the 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 prior history of of the Sopranos. Yeah, I waited on that thing for so long, man. It got pushed back like umpteen times. It was like every time I thought it was close, and it had another pushback. And I think they went yeah. back and added like thirty something pages. I don't know what that correlated to as far as screen time, but I added like thirty pages of dialogue because of COVID and you know everything. Right. But uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I know it's, it's kind of some people are hit and miss, but I'm just like, you know, this was a tale from how things came to be. It wasn't like yeah. another mid episode yeah. of Sopranos. It wasn't an you know? episode of Sopranos. It was, right. it was a, a prequel. It was to show where it all came from. Right. And, and the and fact that Michael succeeded. played his dad was just outstanding. I don't know if that's ever been done. Maybe it has, but I don't, I don't, I, don't, I can't I don't think know. of one. I don't, I can't either. Um, you mentioned uncle junior. A lot, so many great characters on this show. You can't pinpoint down to one. I mean, you had Nancy Marchand oh, killed it in the first two seasons. Terrific. You know, Dominic terrific. playing Uncle June. Oh. You know, yourself. You know, uh, Silvio Dante. Who's a, well, I forget his real name. Uh, Steve Van Zant. You know, Tony Sirico. Christopher Montesanti played by Michael Imperioli. I mean, so many great, great people all in one show. Who was probably your favorite character? It's a two-part question. Who was your favorite character to work with? And then who was your favorite character just in general on the show? Uh, my favorite character to, to work with? Well, that's, I, I really, everybody, every actor on the show was just a, a joy to work with. I, I really, there was no favorite. I didn't, you know, if I work with somebody, it wasn't, uh, wow, I'm really excited, you know, more excited than working, more excited working with Edie or more excited working with Jimmy or, you know, it, it was from the beginning with John as Philly and, and, and with, with Sirico and with, you know, with, with Jimmy, uh, of course, I, I always loved working with Jimmy. I and mean, that was, that was, uh, uh, is he, was he my favorite? Probably. I, he was a, a little notch above that. I really, yeah. really loved working with him. Uh, my favorite character was Edie. Edie Falco was my favorite character. She's a wonderful, wonderful actress, and it's been said, uh, and and I, I agree that she created the great, best mob wife in the history of film or TV or, or or stage. She was spot on, and her acting and as a person, she is the she is the most wonderful, generous, sweet people you could ever meet. Uh, uh, the, the scene with, the uh, our last scene, she turned to me and she said, Danny, I'm never going to work. I said, Edie, you'll work forever. I'll never work again. You'll work forever. <laughs> but she just that she's that humble. That's the humility and the, the talent and just the sweetness, just the wonderful, wonderful woman. And again, I will repeat, it is said, and I agree that she created the best mob wife, the truest mob wife in the history of TV, film, or or uh, stage, and Edie Edie was definitely um, th th that person to me. No, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, before that, that pro probably would have went into Karen uh, or Lorraine Bracco, who was also in The Sopranos as Doctor Melfi. But right. yeah, Carmela Edie Falco just took that character to a whole nother level. And I'd seen her when she was on Oz, right? as the prison guard uh, right. a couple a lot of people from oz was uh was moved over i think uh father anton tola or whatever he he was on oz for yeah, just yeah. a brief spin. yeah johnny johnny sack yeah johnny sacramento yeah yeah vince curatola vince curatola wait you know i started watching the early law and orders just i wanted to see yeah you know people when they put you know this, judge. Is, this is going back 30 years you see so many people who became who succeeded in 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 their lives and in, in the business but that was their early starts. You know, I, I had a couple myself and so did a lot of people, but it's, it's, it's a joy. And, and you're going back 30, 35 years, you know, yeah. way back. So if you get a chance, you watch the early law and orders, that's, you'll see, mm -hmm. you'll see people that you'll recognize later on in life who became successful in the business. And that was another character too. I hadn't spoke about him just cause I was kind of focusing, I guess, on the, the New, New Jersey family. But Vincent Caratola just killed Johnny Sack as that role. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
Vince is a, a, a terrific actor and a great, a great guy. We were, we were very close. He was like, I'm, I'm nine years older than he is, but he was my big brother. He, he was much more knowledgeable in the business than I was. And he was always giving me helpful hints and, and helping me out. And, uh, and he just did a great job with Johnny Sack. Yeah, his his lines, the way he delivered them, the you know, what's this? The fucking you in now? I mean, just that that yelling, almost a little Al Pacino esque. You know how oh, he yeah. yells sometimes right. and, and deliver those lines. On up until when he died in prison with cancer. You right. know, he's in there and he's like, you know, you got stage four. He's like, so no stage five. And I mean, just just a fantastic actor. I can't say enough and, about him. One and, of my favorite. And the characters. way and the way he loved his wife. Uh, which yeah. is so believable and so wonderful uh he he there was a lot of a, a lot of colors that vince created yeah and, uh, as they said he's a, a terrific a terrific guy too very 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 yeah good. that whole storyline with the wade and the joke that ralphie cracked and everything and how close oh, he was yeah. to to killing him that was a good one too like when he hired that guy to go down i think it was in florida and he's in the elevator with ralphie and that's when he goes back and jenny's got the candy downstairs and he calls off the hit and they're like, he's in the elevator with him. Ralphie had no clue how close he was to getting it right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was some of your like most favorite, I guess, scenes to be a part of, or some of the most just memorable scenes from the show, uh, all together? Because if I got to look at a, a episode as a whole, I love the Pine Barrens. I'll rewatch yeah, it. If me I'm too. ever having a bad day, like if I'm having a shitty day from work or whatever the case, I'll put on Pine Barrens. And by the end of it, I'm I'm out of my mood. I'm in a good mood. Um, well, Pine Barrens, I agree. Pine Barrens to me was the best episode in the whole the whole seven seasons. Uh, it was just as funny as can be, and it just the two of them were fantastic. And whatever happened to the Russian, of course. Was yeah, a, was a war cry of all Soprano fans, and uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, Mikey and uh, and uh, and Tony, uh, it, it was fantastic, and the writing was spectacular. It, it made us laugh, and Pine Band is, is great, and Mikey, you know, Mikey is a fantastic talent. Uh, Imperioli, I mean, he's he's just an actor, a, a writer, a producer, a director, and uh, I played his father in his first play, so I know him since he's like 21 years old. Okay. And, uh, I, I've, I've always, I've always, uh, I've always admired his talent from the day I, uh, I, I, you know, I was in the casting process in, in, in the first play off Broadway and, and we thought he was fantastic then. And I've always thought that of, of him. Every time, like a lot of, if we're going traveling or something like that, and you know, we were going to stop to eat and we kept on going and you're in that stretch of riding where there's like no restaurants and i look over my wife and she'll know exactly what i'm talking about because i watch that episode all the time and she likes it too i go we should have stopped at roy rogers i mean that's <laughs> just kind of what i say as a joke that's what she'll know like you should have stopped back there wherever the hell it was outback steakhouse or cracker or whatever you know i'm starving over here crack about <laughs> <laughs> anything it seems like you pass more than them on the interstate down here in south carolina than anything without a bet without a doubt <laughs> Now, one other one I want to gloss over here was uh, White Caps. The mm -hmm. ending of White Caps with uh, James and Edie. I don't know if I've ever seen a more powerful, well acted scene in anything, be it movie, television. I mean, you're going to be hard pressed to put something up against that where two people and the situation that they were in and that scene delivered it so well that that was just top notch damn acting at its finest well they both they both are top notch actors and again the writing being superlative and what good good actors take good writing and elevate it and that they they took the good writing and they elevated it to a, to a tr to a tremendous tremendous height both of them throughout the series throughout the 7 years seven seasons were spectacular there was never a false moment from either one of them and they just they just were sopranos uh well written but also uh well acted by those two as the leaders yeah and also also uh mikey and drea you know the four of them yeah. was, their acting was spectacular that you know made the series that much better uh, than it would have been with lesser actors 
And it's just those little nuances of certain things that maybe your average viewer won't pick up, but the ones that are a little bit more smartened up to how things work in that kind of life. I interviewed Frank Santorelli who played, uh, what was it? Uh, G was it GG? Yeah. GG at the bar. Now, uh, no, he, he played, he didn't play GG. No, what was, was it? Oh, what was, who was the Frank Santorelli, the bartender? What was his name? Yeah. Georgie, Georgie, Georgie. 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 Yeah, yeah. I was getting the G's mixed up. Yeah. Yeah. John Fiore played GG. So Georgie right. is the scene where they're back in the back. I guess that's the Bing and they have the girls back there and Ralph right. G's poking him with the stick or the pool cue. And he po gets him right there in the chest and he grabs it from him and slings it. And he's like, that fucking hurt. He's like, after they call cut, he said, so Rico walked over there to him and said, he pointed at him and he said, kid, he said, you done that. Great. You are perfect. He said, the reason why he said, you never raised your hand to him and you never said anything back to him. He said, cause if you had in the life, you wouldn't have been around anymore. He said, you played that perfect. You took it. You told him it hurt. And that was the end of it. He said, and that's how it's supposed to be done. And it's just little things like that, that the average guy might not know any difference, but it's just in that life. I mean, I, I heard, I don't know how true it is that David Chase would sometimes get phone calls of people saying, Hey, that's not how we would do this type of thing. And then he might, you know, tweak it something a little bit, but I already had a lot of people that would tell him that real mob guys, how things would or should not go on that show. Now, how true that is, I've got no idea. That's just things I've heard. But I always have to remind people it's a TV show. Yeah. It's not real. <laughs> yeah. Because there's, there's a, a clip, I think it's of the DeCavalcanti family. And it's been long since rumored that that was kind of what they were modeled after. But they're sitting around. It's like surveillance tapes. And they're sitting around talking about The Sopranos. And he's like, hey, you seen this show, The Sopranos? He's like, that's supposed to be us. So, yeah. I mean, that's how far it traveled deep into those roots. That uh, that's the room. Vinny Ocean, yeah. Vinny Ocean came from Dyka Heights, Brooklyn. So yeah, he, he lived three blocks from where I grew up. Wow. And supposedly, Sopranos was based on that family in New Jersey. Yeah. We don't. Nobody knows definitively. Chase has never said anything. I don't think. Uh, so uh, that's always the rumor. It's a rumor, but we don't know. So your favorite scene to shoot with you? If you had to pick one out of all of them, like I said, you made it from what season two all the way to the very end when you got away at that gunfight in the parking lot. What was probably your favorite scene to shoot? When I pledge allegiance to Tommy. Uh, I think, uh, and, and and the magic of that scene was, and and the, the, this is the, the shows the loyalty of Jimmy. Well, in that scene, I I think it registers on Patsy's face the pain of having to submit to a man who killed his brother. Yeah. And I, I love the way that scene played out. The, the interesting part about that is we shot, it was late in the day and we had shot, we had shot James's uh, close up and I still had to do my close up and they called the day and Jimmy told them, no matter what, when you shoot Danny's close up, you call me in. Well, they shot it on another day at six in the morning and the assistant director mimicked Jimmy's voice un uncanny. He was uncanny. I was, it, he sounded like Jimmy. And, and so uh, I, I, it was always magic to me. The lighting is the same. The set is the same. They put it together like a puzzle. You could never tell that my close-up was shot five days later at six in the morning and James's close up was shot that night and, and the two shots were that night. But that was my favorite scene because I think it's all, it is a lot written on Patsy's face to have to say, I gave up the grief. And he says it three times. Like, yeah. how many times are you gonna make me say this because I wanna put a bullet in your head? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you, you're making me repeat this, you son of a bitch, yeah. you know? And, and Tony did, Tony to Patsy was, did you give up the grief? Let me hear you. Let me hear you. It's like, let me hear you say it. Yeah. Let me take out a gun right now and put a bullet in your head. Mr. Because yeah. you killed my brother. Tony but, was bad yeah. about that, about poking the bear throughout that. Oh, yeah. He was, oh, that yeah. was, that was his thing there. He would, he would oh, poke yeah. you until you wanted to, fly, I guess, to see how far he could push you. till you yeah, would break. Listen, or that, something. Was, that was my favorite scene. Secondary was peeing in the pool. 
and hitting the guy at the construction site. Those were, and oh, and climbing the pole on Columbus Day, which I did myself five times. And I was like <laughs> 57 years old or something. And, and running down the stream, I was fast as could be. I'm not that fast anymore, but I, I, was, I said to them, no, I can run. I can run. See if you can keep up with me. And the pole, I went up the pole each time, about four, four or five takes. So those were fun. Yeah, the, the pole with the Silvio's looking at the guy, I'm gonna fucking hang you up there. <laughs> I mean, just, the way the way everything was delivered in that man, I don't know if I'll ever see another TV show that comes close with everything in it. You know, the the fantastic yeah. actors, the fantastic writing, the way it's done, you know, like you just said, piecing stuff together, you know, and, and people that aren't smart enough to how the movie business is. I had an interview with Tom Sizemore, who's been in a ton of films. You know, I think all of his movies brought in over a billion dollars, um, saving private Ryan natural born killers, but heat, which is one of my favorites with Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, and, and obviously Tom himself and Val Kilmer. There's that famous scene where they're at the coffee house and Al Pacino is telling him, you know, I'm a cop. And if it comes down to it between, you know, you and some poor bastard's wife, you're fitting to make a widow brother. I'm going to take you down. And then he gives his response back. He's like, you know, look, if there's an opportunity where I got to take you out, I will not hesitate. Not for a second. It's, it's so climactic It's you can feel the tension, but they weren't there at the same time. Right. The right. shots over the shoulder. If you pay attention, the shots are over the shoulder of the other person talking and then vice versa. They gave those, you know, clips or, or scenes or however you want to call them. They gave those at different times. I think there was a scheduling conflict with one or the other. They couldn't be there on the same day. So, but it's like, to me, I'm not an actor. So I would think, how do you keep that same passion? If you know, that's not the guy you're supposed to be talking to, but I guess it's one of them things when you're in it, you're in it and that's your job, but you know, they go fantastic. And like you said, the scene you were talking about was fantastic. You would have had no idea that it was shot on different days and different times. Well, that's the craft. It is a craft. It's just like, you know, it's like woodwork, you know, yeah. you, 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 it's a craft. And the other thing I wanted to say was, I don't think we'll ever see a series like The Sopranos again, but The Sopranos opened the door to sem so many really yeah. good series. We have, we have so much good television now based on, uh, on the superiority of The Sopranos. Yeah. So it brought, it brought television back, it raised the standard and a lot of shows have, have uh, risen. Uh, to the heights. Yeah. And I mean, and just a whole mob genre, you know, I've always been a fan of any mob movie. Um, that whole genre has just always been, you know, one of my personal favorites and it's hard to not get a lot of eyes on it. Boardwalk empire that came, you know, after that, you know, was right. a good show, um, had Steve Buscemi in that, who was also in, you know, Sopranos. I think he directed, uh, Pine Barrens, if I'm not mistaken, that was before his character actually came in as Blundetto. I think he was the director of uh, Pine I mean, Barrens. He's, he's directed a lot. And he, he's he's a sweetheart. What a sweet and a, and a great actor. Yeah, terrific yeah. actor. So yeah. it, it, if you get the right cast and the right people, and and definitely the key, like you've mentioned a couple of times, the right writers, because that can make the breaker show. Is That's, the writing? That is the key. Yeah, the writing. A bad writing, uh, bad writing uh, can be elevated, but not too much. Uh, good writing can't be hurt by bad actors, but can be elevated by, um, by uh, good good actors. Yeah, I only have five percent left on my on my phone. Oh, we're, <laughs> we're about to wrap it up here anyway. Well, well, look here, man. I can't thank you enough for uh, coming on the show. Like I said, Sopranos is one of my all time favorite TV shows ever. And I'm just delighted that you were able to come on the show and share some of your experiences and your, uh, your time. And, you know, from the show last question, and we're going to close it out with this. Who was, there was a, a character that you was happy to see go. Uh, a character that I was happy to see go. Well, it would have to be Ralphie. It would Imagine. have to be Ralphie because Ralphie, uh, you know, the the episode where he kills he kills the girl, which was one of the uh, Crazy, worst yeah. things that ever, that ever happened on on the set. So I think Ralphie was a psychotic. I mean, they're all sociopaths and psychotics. They all are. They're all they're all uh, you know killers. 
but Ralphie was way beyond uh, the violent nature of, of, of the rest of them. Yeah, the, he was the, oh, David he Proval. The character was not a nice person. Absolutely, and David Proval was probably the first big guy to go up against Tony, and he was pretty rough, but Ralphie, I think, even outshined him as far yeah. as just somebody that you were not very unhappy to see go the way, especially the no, way he did there. Right. Yeah. Well, Dan, I certainly appreciate you stopping by the show, my friend. We're glad you could come by and visit, uh, you know, more than happy to sit down and do it again sometime later on. We wish you nothing but the best going forward. I don't know if you have any projects coming down the pipe or any shows, uh, but hopefully we'll see you on the screen and, you know, I might bump into you at a, you know, a convention or something like that down the road. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Wade, and thank you for being such a knowledgeable, intelligent, and terrific Soprano fan. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, it's been my pleasure, too, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Hollywood Wade. That was Dan Grimaldi, and unfortunately, we are out of time. Catch us here next week on an all-new episode of Crime and Entertainment. Dan, thank you, my friend. Thank you.